Hello, welcome back to Infant Mental Health Promotions video series, Infant Mental Health from the Bench. I'm Cheryl Jackson. In Module 2, the Smith family is now living in a nesting arrangement, which was recommended by Council. Buddy, go home, all right? Everything's fine. It was just an accident, I tripped. Keep going. Now that you've gone and done, he's probably gonna go call the cops. What do you mean? It's not my fault, you bastard. Yeah, okay. Our panel is here to share some insights on what we've just seen. Joining me to talk about infant trauma are Lisa Hayes, June Maresca, Jean Clinton, Brenda Packard, and Mary Rella. Mary, what types of experiences are traumatic for a child, a baby? For an infant, uh, any experience where they are left unattended to be, can be uh, a traumatic experience. So a parent who is present but emotionally unavailable might be a trauma experience for the infant because they are 100 percent dependent on the caregiver to be uh, there and available to them to be able to um, regulate their arousal, both the arousal that is stressful and also the arousal that is playful and engaging and delightful. So for an infant who experiences uh, a caregiver who is in the environment but not available to them or attending to them could be a trauma experience. And uh, also that the trauma experience for an infant can be very much relational uh, as opposed to events in, in the environment alone because the events in the environment can be buffered if the relationship is available and attuned to what the distress of the infant is. So you've talked about neglect basically. Yes. But Brenda, what does that look like for a baby? What, what kinds of things constitute neglect? Well, for infants and toddlers, a lot of things constitute neglect. Relational neglect, uh, what Mary has talked about. Children need responsive care. We know that about them. And we know it's traumatic if they don't have it. Uh, for neglect, uh, with respect to Children's Aid Society cases, we do see a lot of neglect of basic needs, neglect of nutrition, which is, is another important component of, a, of what a baby needs. We see neglect of proper sleeping arrangements, proper clothing, um, proper stimulation. We see children who don't go outside, who don't have the proper cleanliness uh, of their environment as well as themselves. We see a lot of lack of medical care, which is a very serious uh, aspect of neglect. We see children who despite repeated reminders about certain medical appointments or they may have medical conditions that require attendant to, we see that parents are not able to manage that. As well as regular well baby checks, which are important for physicians to look at signs of possible uh, neglect, physical neglect as well as um, developmental issues that are happening with this child. So we see a lot of different areas of neglect. Um, I think the most difficult for workers is really looking at the neglect in the relationship that there really is no such thing as a baby. That's what we hear all the time. A baby needs responsive care in order to grow and develop. So for workers, they're often trained to look at those physical things. Where does the baby sleep? Workers are great at going out and looking at the crib. We have all the documentation we need to say. The baby sleeps in the crib. There's nothing else in the crib. We're good at that. We're good at looking at um, how a baby is fed, how much a baby is fed, is a baby dehydrated, that kind of thing. But it's much more challenging to, to look for uh, signs of neglect as well as uh, how to prove that in a court situation, how to 
really speak to our lawyers efficiently about what is happening for this baby. So it requires real observation of the baby, developmental screening, uh, really focusing on the relationship, observing the relationship between the caregiver and the child. Can you see behaviors in the child that suggest that that child has been traumatized? We can see from very early on, we see with babies, uh, non-responsive babies, uh, unconsolable babies, uh, lots of crying, a caregiver who's not able to manage to console that child. Uh, as children get a little bit older, as they're toddling around in, in the toddler age, we see children who are labeled out of control. Um, children who are damaging things around the home, running around aimlessly, uh, not able to be consoled by their family members, uh, leaving the home situation and getting out of the house and wandering around, uh, looking for uh, looking to other people to be cared for. I mean, children are pretty smart. If their parents are not providing their basic needs, they're going to go down the hall and look for food and, and look for some attention, look for a cuddle, maybe from the wrong person. Mm. Um, that's where we start to see the indiscriminate behavior, and that's a real sign for us. We see children... Um, coming up to people and wanting to go home with them. Often workers go to the home, can I come home with you? Looking through their purse, touching their hair, uh, and workers really, I don't know what this is. Well, it's a sign of neglect. They're not getting their basic needs met. Jean, how can trauma influence an infant's or a toddler's development, both the short term mm -hmm. and long term? Yeah, um, I think we've focused on, um, on neglect uh, so far here um, and the relational, um, uh, so emotional harm. Um, and how do, you, how do you measure that? One of the most concerning situations is when the caregiver is the source of the frightening or, or trauma. Um, and uh, they, are the, they are the most serious uh, uh, situations. The long-term implications um, that in, in terms of the, what studies have looked at is children who experience their caregiver, the trauma, is in the relationship. They are the children who have the most significant, um, all of the things that Brenda is saying, the most be significant behavioral difficulties um, as they're up in toddling, um, uh, more aggressive in infancy, withdrawal, apathy, um, uh, not, not growing. Uh, physically not growing, uh, not growing well. And how you can observe it um, is uh, when, um, if an infant or a toddler is separated from their caregiver, um, when the caregiver comes back, what you expect, you know, so the, you're separating the, the, the child, the child is upset, and so when the caregiver comes back, you want the child to be saying, oh, thank goodness, daddy's back or mommy's back. Um, and if the child doesn't respond in that way, we should have alarm bells um, uh, going. And what sometimes we see is that the child uh, who's upset because the parent's not there uh, goes towards the parent and then freezes or approaches the parent backwards or you see peculiar interactions. So trauma affects the brain development and you can all we can do so far is measure in these behaviors. So are there instances when access has been ordered when that visit might be traumatic for the child? There are many times that that is occurring um, and I think there's some very good conversation going on now uh, within child welfare to say how can we make these access visits actually useful um, either for assessing what's going on in terms of the relationship uh, or in fact intervening um, and so sometimes it's ignorance that parents don't know that that frightening face um, is terrifying to the child and so you can actually you know there are opportunities to actually do some improvement um, to that, um, um, uh, that responsiveness. Unfortunately, just now, uh, the uh, degree of training that people have in terms of observing access is very, very variable across the province. And I hear uh, many, many stories in my 30 years with child welfare of uh, people having no idea what to do. And when I hear it, I say, that kid should have been hauled out of there right away. They were being traumatized by that experience, the parent ignoring them, not responding to them, the, the, the kid lying on the floor and then going silent. They are just such huge alarm bells. It's like having a tumor on your head. We need to respond in the same way as we would.